Uh, good afternoon um, for all of you in 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 uh, the states, and um, uh, rather good morning for um, if if there's anyone from this side of the world, like in in Asia or Oceania, if if there's anyone among the members, um, it it will probably be good morning for us. Um, so uh, my name is Maria Todorova, uh, as as Jan. Um, uh, said in, at, at the beginning, and I will be talking about interpreting um, in emergencies um, in a highly globalized world in which crises are interconnected and then they cascade over national borders. Um, thanks. I, I want to thank um, the, the hosts of, of this um, series, of this event. Um, uh, and um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk um, and for making all the arrangements for this talk. Um, and um, thank you for all the participants who spared their time um, to listen to this talk. Uh, so Jan, um, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful and generous introduction at the very beginning. Um, I, I just want to add um, uh, just once uh, more thing maybe that um, might also be um, interesting for for our uh, participants. I I not only um, am interested in researching emergencies. So emergencies um, are also part of my personal experience, um, or interpreting rather interpreting and translation in 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 emergencies are part of my personal experience. Um, in particular, I used to work, so I, I am now in Hong Kong, but I used to work um, and live, um, right, in um, uh, ex-Yugoslavia, and, and I used to work in several international organizations during the conflict, um, or, or conflicts that happened um, uh, in ex-Yugoslavia and later in, in Kosovo. So I was serving as interpreter. And, and other um, uh, different roles at uh, border crossings uh, and in refugee camps. And I made significant, you know, all this experience made a very significant mark on me um, personally and um, interpreting practice and um, research that I'm doing. So before delving into um, the topic um, of, of the talk today, I just want to um, consider some general definitions of, of some key concepts. And um, the notion of emergency is very complex, right? And uh, while there is no internationally accepted um, definition for emergencies, it is often used in national and international documents on emergency planning and management. In most of uh, this usages, emergency is closely related to hazards, crises, disasters. So these words are very often used interchangeably. Um, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction defines disaster as um, serious disruption of the functioning of a community or a society at any scale due to hazardous events inter um, interacting with conditions of exposure, vulnerability, capacity leading to one or more of um, uh, human material, economic um, and environmental impact. As mentioned in this definition, um, another term that relates to disaster um, is the word hazard. Um, so it's kind of the trigger uh, for disasters. According to Federici, um, a local natural hazard can trigger a disaster aggravated by existing crisis in a society. For example, and uh, Federici gives this example, it's the flooding causing internal migration, uh, forcing people uh, to move to uh, poorer communities that have already been living on limited resources. So kind of one happening after another and then um, the crisis cascades. Um, Crisis can also be understood as an event um, with sudden or rapid onset that can disrupt um, the routines of an individual or a collective, more often a collective, and that poses some level of risk of da or danger. 
And this is quoting uh, or adapted, this definition is adapted in, by, by O'Brien. Defined like this, crisis, um, subsequently emergencies as well, can include um, disasters, but also situations of armed conf conflict um, that poses large scale disruptions, risk, and displacement of people, right? So it extends, um, uh, the definition extends the meaning of, of uh, crisis to include um, disasters, but also armed co conflicts. More recently, um, the global COVID-19 pandemic that we can't avoid mentioning, right, reinforced the notion that public healthcare situations that seriously disrupt the routine of a collective and pose a severe risk level can also be classified as um, emergencies. And then finally, um, rather than belonging to just one type, um, emergencies develop into complex cascading disasters. And um, again, Federici points out to this, um, defined as extreme events in which cascading effects in progression over time generate unexpected secondary events of strong impact that can often be aggravated by the failure of physical structures and social functions that depend on them, or by inadequacy of disaster um, mitigation strategies, right? And, and that's where, um, uh, that's the aspect that we are interested in. So this type of crisis necessitates a multidisciplinary approach that uh, also takes into account the interplay of various factors, including language, um, and then culture, uh, technology, and we'll mention a bit of, about technology and um, different social dynamics um, in, in, the, um, in the community, right, that is affected by, um, by the crisis. So no matter which definition we use, a recurring theme in the literature is that, um, uh, is, is the critical role of language. Um, and interpreting in responding to these emergencies. And, and that's mentioned in, in um, a, a variety of, of studies. Um, thus, in um, translation and interpreting studies, researchers like O'Brien, for example, um, uh, advocate for the recognition of crisis translation, um, and I would add an interpreting as a special practice area. But when we say translation, we usually kind of, um, in, in translation studies, it, it implies or includes interpreting as well. But uh, for the purposes of this um, particular uh, seminar or workshop, um, we will um, focus on, on interpreting. So translation and interpreting practices um, in crisis and emergencies are a relatively new sub area in translation and interpreting studies. Emergency translation and interpreting have been so far studied in a variety of um, uh, different and distinct contexts. Um, so most significant research has been conducted in um, interpreting in conflict related settings. And um, Jan mentioned the two books. Um, that um, uh, Lucia Ruiz uh, Rosendo from University of Geneva and, and I have been in um, editing, right? We are at the moment working on um, uh, a, a larger uh, Rutledge handbook um, on, on this particular topic as well. So, so that one hopefully will um, kind of cover all the different aspects of um, interpreting in conflict when it's, when it's ready. Um, right. Um, this research, um, uh, so, so as I said, um, most of the research is, um, uh, that has been done recently is in conflict related settings. Um, some research, um, in, in the recent, I, I think decade, um, has also, um, been conducted on humanitarian interpreting. So humanitarian interpreting has, um, developed into a, um, separate term, right, uh, within interpreting studies. Um, and then um, most recently, we are looking at interpreting uh, during pandemics. So, so there's been um, uh, quite a lot of research coming out um, as, as a result of um, the pandemic.
So with the current developments around the world um, that are receiving so much attention um, from the um, uh, international media, uh, and I'm talking here about the, um, uh, all the current events, right? Um, the, the various conflicts that are happening at the moment, um, um, but also uh, disasters and, and kind of um, uh, environment or, or climate uh, change related uh, weather events, um, we are increasingly aware um, that all this uh, results in dire humanitarian emergencies, right? Particularly at border crossings, that civilians are moving um, um, uh, away from immediate danger. So urgent attention and support uh, from the international community are necessary to ensure the safety and well-being of those affected, um, both in violent conflicts, but in um, uh, disasters as well. So interpreters have a crucial role in helping um, you know, this, this um, migrating and, and uh, uh, communities uh, or communities on the move or asylum seekers um, to access immediate humanitarian um, assistance um, from international organizations, but they also um, helping during um, asylum procedures and, and so forth. And I've uh, worked on this topic um, quite a lot um, recently in, in different settings. So humanitarian interpreting practices are also as essential in providing immediate aid um, to um, victims of disaster, as I said. Um, in disasters, interpreters um, play a crucial role in facilitating communication between um, both the international humanitarian responders, but also uh, and, and the affected communities and um, individuals. Um, so they help ensure that vital information is accurately conveyed and then people can access assistance um, that they need. And finally, in the last five years, um, it, it has been confirmed that crisis and emergency interpreting in healthcare is a critical aspect of communication in times of global health emergencies, such as, the, uh, such as pandemics. It refers to the rapid conversion of vital medical information into various languages in order to facilitate communication between healthcare providers, policymakers, and uh, um, the general public. So scholars have um, increasingly focused on the intersection of crisis uh, translation and interpreting and public health um, equity. Um, they have suggested um, frameworks that concentrate on gathering language data from patients, um, clinicians in healthcare systems, creating public um, health uh, messages that are bo both linguistically, but also culturally appropriate, um, and educating healthcare workers in communication skills. So um, research has also shown that language barriers can lead to increased um, patient anxiety, right? De um, decreased adherence to treatment plans um, and poor health outcomes. So by addressing these barriers or language barriers, crisis interpreting has the potential to improve patient outcome and overall health um, during emergencies um, at, at a significant level. However, um, the contributions of interpreters are often overlooked or undervalued in, in this kind of settings, the crisis settings, right? Um, so, so people don't immediately um, think or um, uh, uh, use um, in interpreters. So these situations can lead to misunderstandings, um, delays in response, or even harm to those um, who are already um, vulnerable. So to address these issues, it is vital to recognize the importance of language support in emergencies and to provide the ad adequate training and resources for interpreters. So these include developing protocols for working with um, diverse populations, um, establishing clear lines um, of communication, um, ensuring that language services are integrated into emergency planning and response efforts. So doing so can help ensure that everyone has access um, to the information and the assistance they need during times of crisis. 
interpreting plays an indispensable role in facilitating communication between different um, parties during uh, crisis and emergencies. Um, so although conflict-related emergencies, disasters, and public health crisis each um, presents a unique uh, challenge, right? They, they have some unique um, uh, aspects. Uh, and then even within those um, big areas, um, they, they also uh, will vary um, uh, or the needs will vary from um, geographical region to geographical region, right? Um, however, um, you know, or, or, or in, well, interpreting in conflict disaster and, and health crisis involves distinct features and priorities. Analysis reveals um, a number of shared um, kind of needs uh, across these domains that fall into um, this crisis translation and interpreting um, area. Right. Um, so, during emergencies, including disasters, conflict, and pandemics, traditional practices and ethical considerations may not be enough. Um, additionally, studies have identified um, a need for en enhanced coordination, quality assurance uh, mechanisms, and streamlined communication channels between local interpreters, international humanitarian actors, and impacted communities during um, crisis. So developing shared um, terminology lists, uh, crisis response glossaries, um, and uh, procedures for interpreting requests uh, can help maximize accuracy. And um, maybe some of you have um, been involved. Um, I, I um, have definitely um, in, involved my um, uh, class uh, as well here in, in Hong Kong in um, developing a terminology list um, when uh, the earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria happened. Um, so um, if, if you are familiar with that, uh, um, uh, scholars in, in translation studies at uh, University of Bogazice in Turkey have developed um, a glossary list um, in uh, a variety of different languages um, to help uh, with the um, uh, rescue and recovery uh, procedure. And um, it, it was shared um, uh, throughout the global community of um, uh, interpreters and um, uh, translators and, and volunteers uh, who then um, helped develop this um, terminology lists. So um, another issue is cultural competence, um, community um, participation as well, and addressing power asymmetries arising as key ethical considerations during crisis interpreting. Um, so one of the most critical issues identified by researchers is the um, effective communication and coordination required um, a dip or requires a deep understanding of the linguistic and cultural landscape of um, the affected population, right? So um, what languages we need to um, interpret from and into, um, uh, so, so not just the majority language, but also including minority languages and, and all the necessary. So, so knowing the linguistic landscape and the cultural landscape is, is very important to plan uh, interpreting services. So consequently, researchers advocate for balancing competing demands of uh, quality uh, through technology, uh, rigorous quality control strategies, streamlined coordination with local partners and co cultural uh, competent um, practices. So ongoing uh, training to handle crisis-specific terminology, evaluation mechanisms for interpreting quality, and respect for cultural and ethical dimensions of communication are all necessary um, to promote effect effective ethical um, interpreting practice across emergency contexts. So a priority across domains is the immense 
um, ethical and practical challenges of ensuring accurate um, interpreting under crisis conditions. So the frequent uh, traumatic nature of conflicts, disasters, and public health emergencies place um, intense demand on interpreters regarding terminology, accuracy, and cultural sensitivity. So interpreters must uh, quickly master specialized vocabulary um, uh, around warfare um, or healthcare or um, disaster medicine, um, while also navigating culturally specific communication norms. So um, meanwhile, the urgent need to accurately convey um, instructions or help guidance um, leaves little time for nuance um, quality assurance. So errors or inadequately adapted interpreting can obstruct access to humanitarian assistance, exclude minority uh, linguistic communities, or uh, dangerously misinform vulnerable populations during crisis. The scholars have noted that poor interpreting practices under emergency conditions can endanger lives. Um, so one such example is presented in the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, Initiative um, uh, Disaster Relief uh, 2.0 in 2011, um, using the example of the um, uh, Haiti earthquake. Scholarship on interpreting during conflict, disaster, and healthcare also reveals how linguistic inclusion shapes uh, humanitarian outcomes. Uh, language barriers and asymmetries in communication access can rapidly um, intensify vulnerability in times of um, um, upheaval or, or um, danger, right? Populations um, unable to comprehend warnings, um, relief instructions, public health guidance, um, or details of their rights may be uh, denied life-saving assistance or placed at um, greater risk of illness, violence, exploitation, and, and so forth. And finally, in public health emergencies, um, timely and accurate um, interpreting of medical guidance, public health orders, vaccination information, um, other critical data can have enormous implications for um, infection control and community outcomes, right? However, um, research has indicated um, that linguistic minorities often face barriers uh, to access health um, information during crisis. So additionally, scholars argue that groups um, with limited medical language proficiency or digital literacy um, see increased risk of infectious diseases or poor health outcomes. Meanwhile, uh, reliance on, on ad hoc interpreters um, during health crisis can propagate, and, and any crisis uh, for that matter, can propagate dangerous misunderstanding around um, you know, virus symptoms, treatments, public health orders, or um, any other information. So consequently, experts increasingly recommend integrating interpreting and language access into humanitarian response and crisis management protocols across sectors. And um, you know, both Federici um, uh, and his colleagues and Footed and uh, her colleagues have um, mentioned this. Um, so the linguistic turn, um, the, there's even a um, uh, discussion about a linguistic turn in public health that calls for greater attention uh, to the role, role of language and interpreting, especially in public health um, practice. So key steps, including recruiting diverse linguistic staff, solicitating community feedback on communication needs, um, partnering with local cultural brokers, and ensuring qualified interpreters are available in crisis. Um, so these are the, the key steps. Um, such actions will empower diverse communities to take life-saving actions, um, while also supporting um, coordination between um, the, the humanitarian actors or the humanitarian organizations, right? Um, and staff in humanitarian organizations. 
So um, studies have verified that inclusive language policies and practices can ultimately help reduce loss of um, life uh, during emergencies and crisis. Right, so to illustrate all that, so I, I, I was talking um, uh, so far um, uh, a lot from a kind of um, theoretical perspective and summarizing kind of um, the, the different studies that have been um, out there uh, and, and doing research on, on uh, these issues. But just to illustrate it with um, an interpreting and translation um, public and disaster set settings on uh, a recent study that um, I have conducted here in Hong Kong. And um, before I start, start with this, um, ju just to mention that this is just a preliminary study, um, a, a very brief um, kind of uh, background study, if you wish, and it will continue in the next two years and hopefully um, it, it will produce more um, in-depth um, uh, results and outcomes. But just as an illustration, um, Hong Kong has once been a recipient, um, and, and for this case study, I'm, I'm talking about disasters in, in particular, right? So um, I, I focus on, on the disaster aspect of um, emergencies and crisis. So Hong Kong, um, has 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 once been a recipient of international um, emergency relief aid um, after the uh, typhoon Wanda in 1962. Uh, so it was a devastating um, uh, typhoon um, that that uh, created a lot of damage. Um, Hong Kong ha has since grown into um, a, a more stable and um, uh, economically developed city that uh, provides uh, relief um, worldwide. Um, so this relief is um, uh, managed um, uh, by the Hong Kong Disaster Relief Fund um, that was established in 1993 to provide an instrument for the Hong Kong SA um, uh, or, or Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government to respond to international pleas by countries in need of humanitarian aid uh, in the, the relief, in, uh, for the relief of disasters occurring outside of Hong Kong. So for the purposes of the Disaster Relief Fund, a disaster um, uh, in, in their documents is defined as natural disasters and non-natural catastrophes. Uh, for example, an explosion of nuclear chemical facilities, um, terrorist attacks uh, causing substantial damage, um, post-disaster rehabilitation and um, reconstruction. Um, uh, right, so any explosions um, uh, and, and so forth, but they exclude ongoing problems such as refugee problems, right, um, war as well. So, so any, anything that's protracted um, is, is not included into this um, disaster really fun definition of, of disaster. Given the rising trend in both um, the number of approved applications and funding amounts um, in respect of um, uh, grants allocated to relief organizations. The annual uh, appropriation of the fund has been increased uh, over the years from 50 million um, Hong Kong dollars, so I'm talking in Hong Kong dollars here, on its establishment um, to 80 million Hong Kong dollars in 2016-2017, uh, and then further uh, 100 million um, Hong Kong dollars 2019-20. to uh, 20. In the period from its establishment, um, in March, well, end of March, um, uh, un until end of March 2020, um, there's been 18 uh, humanitarian organizations. So the fund is distributed um, through humanitarian, so intermediaries, uh, humanitarian organizations, but also uh, government authorities um, in, in various countries. Um, so in, in this period, um, 18 organizations and nine government authorities have received a total of about um, 2 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars. Among the 18 relief organizations receiving grants from the fund, um, the top five recipients, um, 
so far include um, World Vision Hong Kong, uh, Oxfam Hong Kong, uh, the Salvation Army, Amity Foundation Hong Kong, and the Hong Kong Red Cross. And I've been working more closely with, with the Hong Kong Red Cross. Um, so they have um, received grants totaling, um, you know, more than 800 um, million Hong Kong dollars, which um, amounts um, or um, makes uh, about 40 percent of the total grants approved by the fund. In terms of geographical distribution, um, right. Um, China is the biggest recipient. Well, um, this here on the slide represents um, the um, uh, disaster relief fund report from 2019-2020. Uh, um, it, it varies from year to year. Um, so, so this is just a snippet of, of one, uh, one year, one report. Um, but um, very often China is the biggest recipient of grants. Um, it receives about, you know, here, um, it's, uh, there's a mistake in that number, I, I believe, because it should be 68%, um, followed by other parts of Asia. Um, uh, so, so these countries will include um, the Philippines, India, uh, Bangladesh, and so forth. Um, so that's about 25% um, uh, in, in general. Um, Right, so, so this is just one year that you have on the slide, but um, in, in more general terms over a period of time. So it's been um, China with 68% and then Asia with 25% um, and Africa with um, close to 5% of the total funds. Um, so, so this is again from its establishment until 2020. So all DRF grants um, are made upon um, the advice of the Disaster Relief Fund uh, Advisory Committee, composed of official and non-official members chaired by the Chief uh, Secretary for Administration here in Hong Kong. Um, this advisory committee also provides guidance um, on the um, policies and practices related to distribution of funds for disaster relief and the size of grants given to specific recipients um, and then monitoring of this um, grant use. Um, so they um, publish reports um, every year uh, uh, that kind of show how the funds um, have been used. So all the funds are provided to various countries around the world. Um, and, and this particular image uh, comes from their uh, photo gallery for the 21-22 um, uh, report. Um, so um, funds are provided to various countries around the world, as I said before, but none of the DRF um, or the Disaster Relief Fund documents and annual monitoring um, reports uh, don't mention language or interpreting services as a provision that needs to be taken into consideration when um, distributing um, relief aid. As you can see, information is usually available only in, in English um, whenever they provide assistance as shown in this picture. So um, what we did is to do a quick survey um, among humanitarian um, organizations that were users of the funds in order to understand their language use. So there's no requirements in, in terms of the, uh, the funder, right? Um, but then what about the, um, the humanitarian organizations, um, how they um, organize the, the use of language, um, whether they use any interpreting um, services, what are their interpreting practices and so on. So as can be seen um, from the survey results, uh, humanitarian organizations in Hong Kong do not have interpreting teams and interpreting policies in place, um, no professional interpreters. Um, they're rarely engaged to provide interpreting services. So they rarely on rare occasions um, engage um, uh, professionals, professional interpreters. Um, this really corresponds with findings from um, other international humanitarian organizations, as mentioned by um, uh, Federici in, in 2019. 
However, rather than relying on a few bilingual employees who are able to interpret between predominantly English speaking main office and um, uh, the local beneficiaries or benef beneficiary community or affected community, right? Um, the communication in the Hong Kong based uh, humanitarian organizations in, is conducted by adding um, a, step, uh, a step that includes um, English and occasionally Portuguese um, as an intermediary language between the uh, Chinese uh, speaking stuff and um, local languages of the um, uh, affected communities. So this is especially relevant in their work with developing countries in, in um, East Asia and Africa that have uh, a common linguistic um, kind of colonial legacy. So they will um, use English, um, uh, sometimes Portuguese um, in, in certain cases as um, still their uh, one, one of the uh, national languages. So in their everyday work, employees in Hong Kong uh, humanitarian uh, offices are expected to be bilingual. Um, so they, um, all of them will speak uh, both English and Chinese. When I mention Chinese here, I, um, uh, I, I include both Cantonese and, and Putonghua, uh, right? Or both. So, so they can either speak only Cantonese uh, or only Putonghua, um, which is Mandarin um, or, or both the languages, performing their tasks in um, both of these languages simultaneously. So based on the focus group discussion uh, that was conducted after the survey, um, they're either native in English and can use Chinese as heritage language or native in Chinese and they can use um, English where they have been educated in English, uh, gaining nearly native proficiency in English. So this is in line with the common practice in Hong Kong of requiring employees um, in the professional workplace to be able to speak and write um, English um, at, at, a, at a high high level. So compared with textual analysis from the uh, disaster relief fund documents, um, and procedures for application and reporting, Hong Kong relief organizations are expected to be able to present their reports um, uh, or the reports of their work in both English and Chinese. Um, so the DRF um, report um, requires them to um, present information is in both English and Chinese. Um, right, so the latest DRF report, well, this is not the latest, there have been a new one, but at, at that time, the latest DRF report, um, so this is 2021, 2022, I believe, um, presents um, the DRF website uh, alongside project illustrations, um, as I uh, briefly showed before, um, and captions. Um, and then it features an additional pop-up window, um, uh, sometimes on, on the website. Um, and this uh, pop-up window will show, uh, will show uh, short summaries of feedback um, kind of statements um, from uh, project um, users or, or final um, aid users. Um, so um, this user statements uh, can be assumed to have undergone interpreting and translation um, from a local uh, language spoken by community members, um, then into English, uh, right? And then using the English translated into um, Chinese. So, so the whole statement undergoes adaptations and transformations of um, the voice of the um, affected community um, members, um, but then um, that's not really um, mentioned or acknowledged everywhere, uh, anywhere in, in, in this process. Right, on the other hand, staff at the Hong Kong Humanitarian Office cannot speak the languages of the uh, affected communities, right, in relief areas, making their direct, so I'll just go back a bit, um, making them um, direct communication with the relief recipients almost um, impossible. 
Um, so they have all said that they don't really have any direct um, uh, communication with um, the, the affected community. Even though in some countries, including um, Malawi, for example, India, Mozambique, Cameroon, um, and others, um, they have retained the languages of their colonial heritage as official languages, just like in Hong Kong after the independence. Often members of the most vulnerable population in these countries are not literate in the official um, languages, and they speak one of the many other uh, locally used languages. So uh, the distribution of disaster relief services and activities, including relief items um, and also non-tangible relief support um, that comes as um, psychological support, right? Um, or, or any trauma-based trauma, uh, trauma -based, um, uh, support um, is done through engaging multilingual local partners uh, with knowledge of English um, as an intermediary language and one or more of the local languages in the disaster affected communities. So in order to communicate with the non-English, non-Chinese speaking um, users uh, in relief areas, the Hong Kong relief organizations engage in uh, local partners uh, with knowledge of English um, and the local languages of the uh, relief um, recipients. Nonetheless, this does not mean that um, there, there are no linguistic challenges throughout the linguistic, um, the relief work. So while um, the selection of project um, countries, um, just let me just go back, right. So you can see here how they communicate and then um, what are this, um, kind of intermediaries or, or local um, partners. Right. Um, so the selection of countries is not necessarily affected by language knowledge. Um, unlike, for example, what Delgado Luchner mentions um, in uh, when she uh, does research on Swiss development NGOs, right? So they pick, um, she, she kind of um, uh, concludes that they, language proficiency really um, motivates which country uh, gets selected. Um, the, the main selection criteria uh, for uh, the Hong Kong relief aid um, is determined by an appeal made um, for a specific disaster or uh, for a specific emergency context. Um, but we could still hypothesize that the use of English or um, Portuguese um, as languages with a colonial past in, in this region might play a part in the provision of humanitarian and relief aid in a certain uh, country. Additionally, the availability of local partners uh, with certain local language skills might be crucial um, in which uh, com in, in the decision of which communities get access to relief aid um, and support. However, these local partners are not required to have any um, interpreting training or uh, certification. Uh, for conducting the groundwork, um, the Hong Kong Red Cross, for example, engages volunteers and local staff in the relief um, area. Uh, the interviewees pointed out that local staff can provide localization and engage with the community using their local language, interpreting from English into the local languages spoken by various ethnic groups. Um, this supports previous um, research. Um, uh, that um, uh, meaning that in emergency contexts, it is preferable um, uh, for the community and and their social capital. Um, uh, so so to engage interpreters from the community who have social capital in the community, and then that enables trust as well. Uh, trust is a very important aspect of. Um, uh, delivering or, or communicating in um, emergency situations. 
Um, however, these volunteers and local staff have often not been trained in interpreting and have various interpreting skills. Moreover, interpreting training in locally used languages is often um, unavailable from government supported education institutions. Um, so there is a need to provide them with appropriate professional training to perform their roles um, with more expertise. So I, I think we are kind of um, getting closer to um, my um, designated time. So I would just want to kind of conclude briefly by mentioning two um, topics that are um, important for um, interpreters in um, kind of emergency settings. Um, so um, one um, of one topic of note will be the uh, trauma related self care. Emergencies are traumatic events for everyone involved, um, for interpreters as well. Uh, given the high stress nature of crisis, interpreters often work under immense pressure and demanding uh, conditions, which can substantially affect their um, physical and emotional well being. Um, so the urgency and gravity um, of the information that they handle can lead to um, long work hours, sleep deprivation, um, emotional stress. And I, I believe, you know, the, the ones who are um, uh, following this um, uh, seminar series have already um, listened to uh, one of the previous um, seminars where my colleagues um, talked about um, emotion, emotional um, kind of uh, aspect of interpreting. So this is particularly important when the um, uh, interpreter interprets uh, distressing content or work with uh, works with people directly affected by crisis. Um, it is crucial therefore uh, that interpreters actively engage in self-care practices to manage stress, um, to prevent burnout, um, Research, especially by uh, Crazy and Lai, uh, have mentioned several um, kind of self-care techniques like um, physical exercise, walking in nature, meditation, mindfulness, um, talking with friends and peers. So support could come from uh, both personal networks, um, such as family and friends, but also from professional networks, um, talking with peers, mentors, professional counselors, and so forth. And then um, a cross-conflict disaster and healthcare crisis. Um, researchers also call for more attention to the growing yet controversial role of technology. Um, even though it provides um, uh, helpful, um, you know, it, it can be helpful in certain situations. Some researchers cite uh, risk of um, over-reliance or imperfect tools that lack nuances or nuance cultural and ethical understanding uh, for, for this kind of high stake um, situations. Um, for settings like refugee interviews, for example, or emergency room uh, interactions, technologies um, can, can still not completely replace human um, interpreters and cultural brokers. Um, the use of technology raises uh, concerns um, in healthcare, uh, especially healthcare uh, situations uh, about patient um, confidentiality, data security, and this is not just in healthcare situations, right, in any kind of situation. So data security, um, potential erosion of trust um, between healthcare providers or humanitarian um, relief providers and um, either patients or um, users of, of uh, or affected communities. So as tools continue to improve, a key priority identified in the research is the need for human oversight, um, quality control um, in, in this kind of high stake uses um, uh, during crisis. Um, so um, establishing best practices still remains um, evolving and is very much context um, specific.